As we turn the corner and approach the final weeks of the biblical worldview series, as we were getting around the letters W and X, and people were coming up to me asking me to do the alphabet all over again, but use different words next time. (laughs) To my answer to that was no. And even someone came to me and said, then use another language's alphabet. Someone said, how about the Chinese alphabet? Well, Chinese doesn't have an alphabet. It's, it's, it's all characters and variants. And when I looked it up, it's 100,000 characters and variants. If you want to do a sermon series for 1,900 years, I added it up, then we could do that. But I don't know about you, but I plan on being in heaven by that time. Anybody with me on that one? And I know that they were asking this or even requesting this because there was an exciting, there's been a buzz and we've, we've uh, talked with people um, both in this country and around the world that are following with us and, and prepared to use the material. Cindy and I just recently were in Dallas and a father brought his, I believe she was about 12, 13 years old, her little girl up to uh, Cindy and I and, she just, and he said, my daughter wanted to meet the alphabet man. I've been called many things in my life, but I've never been called the alphabet man. Um, I could tell you that. I feel like the people that have asked are good intention, but have a remnant of the Apostle Peter inside of them. Listen to what the Apostle Peter said on top of the Mount of Transfiguration when he saw Jesus speaking to Moses and Elijah. He said, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as a memorial, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. What Peter was asking, or what Peter was saying was, I'll leave the fishing business and I'll go into the home construction business. So we can just camp right here and build three homes. But let's keep on talking to Moses and Elijah and let's never leave this place. And there's always something in us that doesn't want to let something good to end so we figure out ways to extend whether it's a book or a movie a lunch a relationship and even for Peter it was the Mount of Transfiguration but there was a problem that was brewing that Jesus knew but Peter couldn't see it while Peter was wanting to extend the time on the mountain Jesus knew something was brewing at the bottom what Peter was unaware of was that it was happening at the bottom of the Mount of Transfiguration. What was happening? There was a little boy who was under demonic influence that was being burned and drowned each day by demonic, a demonic um, demons inside of him. And there was a desperate father that wanted this little boy healed while they were, while Peter was talking about building shelters on the mountain. What was happening at the bottom of the hill was just as important as what was happening on top of the hill. The question on the floor on the Mount of Transfiguration is do we continue to stay and talk with Elijah and Moses? The book of Luke says they were talking about the the cross and the resurrection. Or do we go down and see a little boy get set free? Well, Peter already turned in his vote, but thank God Jesus has the majority votes. And Jesus chooses to to realize, we're done up here. We've got a job now down there. Listen to what the people were doing as they were coming down. The Bible says at verse 14, at the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly, but he often falls into the fire and into the water. And I love that phrase in verse 14 when it says the crowd was waiting for them. Somehow the crowd knew What even though Peter had no plans for, the crowd knew that Jesus would come back. That he wouldn't just stay up there. And Jesus does come and sees healing and deliverance come to this little boy. Jesus faced something similar, even more important, with his disciples. Jesus told his disciples... 
that his time here on planet earth was coming to an end. They were sad and that Jesus was speaking about the conclusion of his earthly ministry, that he would go to the cross, resurrect, and then ascend to the right hand of God the Father. But Jesus tried to explain why it was better for him to leave. This is what he said in John 16, 7. But in fact, it's best for you that I go away because if I don't, the comforter, speaking of the Holy Spirit, won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. Here it comes, folks. In other words, this is what the Bible is teaching us. When something is over, something better is coming. When something is finished, <clears throat> something better is on the other side. And I believe this same principle is true even when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. The disciples went to an upper room. Heaven opened up. The Holy Spirit came down, baptized them with fire, filled them with the Holy Spirit. But Jesus would not let them camp there and build homes there. Nobody was allowed to take pictures with their phones and post it on Instagram with fire over everybody's head and invite them to the upper room. Because God didn't want them getting stuck up there. He didn't want them to stay up there. There was something more because when something was over, something better was coming. It's not just a demonic little boy that needed deliverance is why something needed to end on the mountain so Jesus can go down and set that little boy free. But here in Acts 2, a crippled man in Acts 3 needed to dance and leap whose legs have never held him up since the day he was born. And God knew that there was a miracle that needed to come. Let me explain. Acts 3 must follow Acts 2 because something got ignited in the hearts of the 120 that were gathered in that upper room. And I will begin to dive into that for just in a few moments. Listen, those that are intending here, those that are online around the country and around the world, you have been equipped over these last 26 weeks. You have been given what you need. Now it's time to leave the mountain. Now it's time to leave the upper room. Now it's time to put on your armor and get ready for battle for where God is sending us. So here comes our final letter in the biblical worldview alphabet. Even while some of you have been guessing zebra and zephyr. And if that's found in your Bible, we have a new Bible for you to give you biblical words. Here it is. Titus 2.11 is where we're ending the biblical worldview series. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. Starts at the very beginning. Instructing us. Here comes growth to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly right now in this present age. Verse 13, but we are looking for the blessed hope. That's the rapture, the second coming of Christ, the appearing of our glory and a great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify himself a people for his own possession. Here it comes, zealous for good deeds. Folks, there it is. This is the ending. Don't miss this. This amazing list of Titus 2 of what God has done for us from bringing salvation instructing us, giving us a lifted, a hope to look up for the second coming of Christ, gave himself to redeem us and to purify us. What's amazing, when you look at those six and seven things that God has done for us, he says there should be a response that comes back from you. And here's what he said, I've done this, here's the one thing that happens, that the outcome of every Christian's life, when they realize what Jesus has done for them, he says, there comes a zeal, a zealousness to do what God wants you to do. In fact, that word zeal, 
I'll get into it in a moment, literally means a fire that starts burning inside of you. You get fired up. Because God has done something deep inside of you. When you start to realize he came, he died, he set me free, he's coming again. I get fired up about those kind of things. God does something inside of me. That's why today Z is for zeal, zealous for good deeds, zealous to do what God wants us to do. To describe zeal in another way, zeal is this, it will respond to say, we saw this on the Mount of Transfiguration, but we must go down and help that father's boy. Zeal will respond and says, we experienced the fire of God in an upper room, but we have to walk down the stairs into the streets to help a lame man. Let me say it to you like this, listen Times Square Church. Zeal doesn't say, let's keep it going. But zeal says, now what do we do with what just happened? That's what zeal does. Zeal takes the 26 letters and goes, now we build from this. What are we called to do? We don't build a home here, but we go, God, let us go and do what you've asked us to do. That's what the list does. He delivered us so we would in turn see others delivered. We were redeemed and purified so we would become zealous for all that God wants to do through us. The great preacher Spurgeon said it like this, earnest zeal is a natural result of the Holy Spirit's working upon the souls of men. When your zeal is most burning and your love is most fervent, then let the warmth and the fervency all go towards the Lord your God and to the service of him who has redeemed you with his precious blood. He says that's where it starts. It was Jesus that spoke to a lukewarm church in the book of Revelation called Laodicea that says you're neither hot nor you're cold. It was a church that that didn't do anything because it was stuck. And Jesus looked at that church And said these words, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, he says, I need you to be zealous and repent, is what he says. What is zeal? What is that thing that Titus ends with that says it's the result of all that God has done for you? There should be a response from us. And I'll get to this in a moment. Folks, let me just remind you, God has done miracles in our lives today. He has worked miracles. There should be a response. This is what the 19th century English preacher, J.C. Ryle said, loved to read his works. He said, zeal in Christianity is a burning desire to please God, to do his will. I love this part. To do his will, to advance his glory in the world in every possible way. It's a desire which is not natural to men or women. It's a desire which the Spirit puts in the heart of every believer when they're converted to Christ. However, a desire which some believers feel so much more strongly than others that they alone deserve to be called zealous men and women. Now here's the last part. Listen to this. He said a zealous person in Christianity is preeminently a person of one thing. They only see one thing. They care about one thing. They live for one thing. They're swallowed up by one thing. And that one thing is to please God. That's what that one thing is. Folks, zeal is, is by definition, is a burning fire in the soul of men and women that are sitting in this place. There's a, there's a fire burning deep inside of your soul. It's fervent and it's fierce. That's what fire does. It consumes and then it spreads. That's what fire does. It consumes and then it spreads. When you read the word of God, I find that zeal is both, get these two words down, contagious and it's consuming. When you are filled with the fire of God, something starts to burn. I'm telling you folks, it gets contagious. That's why I don't like sitting next to dead people that don't know Jesus. I don't want, I don't want their deadness getting on me. I want to sit next to people on fire for God. Isn't it amazing? 
that when you sit next to someone who just sits there like this, you sit there like this. But sit next to someone like this, you start going, whoa, I guess I can, that spot fires. I'd like to see the fire spread all the way through this place and a fire fill this house and God do something. Fire in the balcony, fire on the main floor, fire in your country and fire online. It's a zeal that's consuming and contagious. The Corinthian church was burning with zeal. Listen to it. 2 Corinthians 9, 2. Your zeal has stirred up most of them. It's contagious. What about Jesus consumed with zeal? John 2, 17, when he walked in and cleansed the temple from money changers, he said, zeal for your house has what? Consumed me. Zeal is a fire to advance the gospel. Zeal is a, a jealousy to defend the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what zeal does. It's a fire deep in our soul. There is, there is a name in the Bible that has always intrigued me. He is a disciple of Jesus, and zeal is always attached to his name. He has... He is not involved with any story. He has never brought a boy with two fishes and loaves and five loaves to Jesus. He has never brought a blind man named Bartimaeus to Jesus. He has never done, he's not part of any story. No stories are about him. He, every time he appears, three times, he's just a name on the list. But I believe the thing and the title that's attached to his name tells a story in and of itself. As I pondered this and prayed about it, he is mentioned three times, and this is his tagline, Simon the Zealot. Why the tagline? Why did the, did the Holy Spirit who authored the Word of God say, I'm just going to leave his name there with a tagline I'm not going to put him in any story. I'm going to, I want you to realize his name is a story. So let me tell you why Simon is called Simon the Zealot. There's three possibilities and people have landed on each one of these three. Then I'll give you my commentary on which one's right. They, there's three possible reasons. One is that he was associated with a sect of radicals called zealots who hated in the first century that the Romans were in political power in Israel, in Jerusalem, and he was part of a group to get the Romans out of government and to put back in the group that he wants to be in power in the government. Number two, it would be a distinguishing name from Simon Peter. Simon, who was the one that wanted to build the three houses. You had Simon Peter and Simon the Zealot. It was just distinguishing. Or the third one is that this man, Zealot, had nothing to do with a sect and distinguishing, but literally he was extremely passionate for Christ, a radical for Jesus Christ. Because the word next to his name actually means to burn with zeal. It was a picture of a boiling pot that was boiling over. Something was burning inside of him. It had to be because tradition says that the way this man died, he died in the Middle East preaching the gospel in Egypt and Iran. That's how he died as a martyr, preaching the gospel, died for the gospel that he walked, that, that he walked with the man that literally birthed the good news, Jesus Christ himself. So which one is it, Pastor Tim? Is it is it the, the group that he is part of, the political group, the zealots, or is it the distinguishing name, or is it simply him that it is his character, that he, is, that he is, has a new passion and a love for Jesus Christ? Here it comes, folks. I believe all three are true. Now, let me explain this to you, because here is what I think is important. Jesus takes a man his whole life was given to politics, here it comes. Okay, here's my favorite line of the biblical worldview series. I don't care 
anymore, okay? So let me, so, so those that are watching around the U.S., this is going to be important. All, all, all you church people, listen, because this is, I've done my best to get you to leave this church. So let me just, let's, let's, let me help you, let me help you today. Jesus takes a man, here it comes folks, get ready, get ready. He takes a man that is passionate for politics because he doesn't like who's in charge in government. So he's going to figure out a way to get his group back on the seat of government. So now his whole life Ooh, I knew people are going to start to go, let's pretend we're going to the bathroom and we're going to get ready to leave. I, I've watched people, I've watched people pretend they're going to the bathroom for 26 weeks. I'm okay with it right now because here's what's happening. Because he said, Simon, you've spent your whole life trying to switch out who's in government because your man's not in the White House. And some of you are all going like, who are we going to pick? We just had our debate and we don't know who's going to be up there. Is Biden going to run? Is Trump going to be there? Is there, are we going to go to jail? And what about the people that were in the Reagan Memorial? And what are we going to do? And while you're worrying about a president, I'm just satisfied with a king. I'm satisfied that King Jesus is absolutely in control. That folks, while you're worrying about all this, I'm passionate about this. I'm passionate that I serve a God who's on the throne. The pulpit isn't a political platform. Listen to me, preachers. This is not a political platform for you to post your candidate. I've got one person I'm in love with and passionate about, and it is Jesus. That's what gets me excited. I think... I think Simon the Zealot got excited. Go, I can get excited now about Jesus. My zeal was misdirected to think politics could change my city. I needed Jesus to change my city. Here, let me, let me say it like this. I'll turn my back so you can walk out. Let me, let me age myself for just a moment. I, I started to like tennis because my wife was a tennis player. And so she got me involved. So here's my age. Before, there was Federer and Djokovic and Nadal. There was a, an American tennis player that we used to love. He was the first one to, to break the Grand Slam record. And his name was Pete Sampras. Loved Pete Sampras. And I read something interesting when he retired. I believe it was with, was with 13 Grand Slams, which nobody thought that that record would ever be broken. And, and Djokovic and Nadal and Federer have, have just, just gone by all those records. But Pete Sampras was number one for many years. And he talked about when he knew it was time to retire at the top of his game. And this was his routine. He said he'd be in the locker room. And while he was in the locker room, he said when he thought about, I've learned all this, I practiced. I've done all that I needed to do. It said he would tie his Nike shoes, put on his Nike sponsored outfit, and then he'd get down and slap the floor. And when he slapped the floor, he was saying, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to play this thing. He said, and then I realized what was happening. I played two tournaments that I lost and I didn't slap the floor anymore. He said, it was as if I've lost the passion. I've lost the burning fire and zeal that when I didn't hit the floor, I knew that it was just a job and a paycheck and I didn't have it anymore. And I knew it was time to retire. Folks, I'm telling you that slapping of the floor I, I maybe not literally do that every time I come out here because there's something inside of me that goes, we got a billion souls to win. We've got lives that need to be changed. 
We've got people. Folks, I'm telling you that when we slap the floor, we're saying, I don't care how old you are. I've got a burning inside of me that I'm go- I've got to get to church. This is not me showing up because it's my religious obligation. We slap the floor going, we get to worship today. We get to hear the word today. We get to lift our hands today. That's why every choir member, every musician, folks, I thank God for gifting and for talent, whether you can play a keyboard, a guitar, or the drums, but if you can't slap the floor and say, God put something in deep inside of me, that I get to worship God with the gifts that he's given to me, that's why we come to God's house. We come here with an excitement and a zeal that's burning deep inside of us because God has saved us. God has changed us. God has filled us. And so today, I've got to do something. I've got to give him the glory for all that he has done in my life. Listen, listen. The world is never moved by mildly interested people. Let me say that again. Your friends are not moved by your mildly invested Christianity. If it's not a zeal and a burning inside of you, they're not interested. Folks, listen to me. I am more afraid of indifference in the church than the persecution of the church. Persecution of the church does it? That fires me up. Some of you going, are you, are you like a glutton for pit? No. I just know when the church is under attack, we're doing something. Slap the floor, we're doing something. We're ready. We're ready. But indifference, to sit in a service with indifference, mildly interested, I believe F.B. Meyer said that if there's one thing which pierces the master's heart with unutterable grief, It's not the world's iniquity, but the church's indifference. Folks, I believe the list in Titus 2 was kindling wood to light a fire in our soul, to remind us. How does the zeal and the fire come to us? It's to remind ourselves, thank God his grace appeared. It's to remind us, thank you that he gives us godliness, instructing us to deny ungodliness in this present age. It's kindling wood for me when I'm reminding I serve a Jesus who's coming back again, the glorious hope of the second coming of Christ. All those things, I believe it's, it's fire in my soul. I'm zealous to worship, zealous to witness, zealous to pray. But something has happened to the church. The church used to be a lifeboat rescuing the perishing. And somehow we become a cruise ship promising rest and vacations for all who sign up. I don't know which ship you're joining, but if you're here looking for a vacation, we give you an armor, we'll give you a weapon. I mean, a a spiritual weapon, a spiritual weapon, a spiritual weapon, spiritual weapon. So somebody's gonna post this, spiritual weapon, spiritual weapon. You cannot make a difference by being indifferent. When you lose the fire, you forgot how you got here and why you're sitting here. You forgot the fire that's deep inside of our soul, but there is a zeal that needs to rise up inside of us again. Do you understand that Jesus himself wrapped himself in zeal when he came to this planet? Listen to it in Isaiah 59, 16. And he saw that there was no man and wondered why there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm, God came. His arm brought salvation. His righteousness, it sustained him. Here it comes. This is the prophecy of one of the prophecies of Christ. He put on righteousness as a breastplate, a helmet of salvation on his head, put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak. He said... I'm not coming going, all right, Jesus, I'll just do. He said, I'm coming burning with the desire that I'm going to see people set free, people delivered, and Satan's works crushed. Something in me burns in my soul about this. 
But here's what's amazing. We get uncomfortable when people follow in Jesus' footsteps and put on the zeal clothing. 1 Peter 2.21 says, let us, as an example, that we will follow in his footsteps. There is so much uncomfortableness with extreme sold-out Christians that have a zeal. Some of you are so uncomfortable sitting with that one next to you that keeps standing up during the service. You just keep... Again? You get... (laughs) What happens is something goes on. You're going... I'm exhausted in church and I didn't even do anything. And you sit and you get, you get, you get almost irritated as the person that keeps yelling next to you and you just keep going, hallelujah, hallelujah. And you're going, and you're thinking, be quiet, we're in church. And they're thinking, we're in church. It's time to yell while we're in church. That's what they're thinking. And it's this opposite. So while you're trying to sit here, they're messing you up. They're, they're, and all of a sudden, you don't know what to do with that person. That's it. And that's why you look to see where they're sitting when you come in next time. So you don't have to sit next to them. But if you come to Times Square Church, there's a lot of us throughout this place that if you sit next to someone, you're going, oh no, another one that I just sat next to. And you don't understand what's going on. Let, let me help you with this. I'm going to define for you a word. What is a fanatic? Here it is. It's someone who loves Jesus more than you. That's what a fanatic is. That's why you're all upset. That's why they bother us. They're screaming, jumping, witnessing. They walk out of church and you're going, let's get a Starbucks. And they're out there still dancing. And you're going, we're not even in the building. But they know Christ is in their heart. The Holy Ghost is deep inside of them. The problem we face today are those that lost the zeal and the fire. Proverbs 26, 20 says, for lack of wood, the fire goes out. And we need to add fire to our souls every day. Your fire may have died because the only time you put wood on it is on Sundays. And if you only put wood on your soul on Sundays, That fire is going to wane. That fire is going to start to smolder. I, I, I believe I've got to put, I've got to put wood on my soul every single day. Every time I open this Bible, I'm adding wood to this, my, my soul. Every time I get on my knees to pray, I feel like I'm putting another log on the fire. When I'm walking in the house and just singing a song or just worshiping him, there's a fire that's coming on. There's a fire that's starting to well up inside of me. I think the church has, has found a wrong zeal. We, we at times, we, we, we can begin to not even, not even begin to be self-aware that in, in, a, in, a, in an hour or so, People are going to be screaming for sporting events on a Sunday and on a Saturday. But all of a sudden, the zeal is gone for the house of God. For the house of God. The house of God has not consumed us. Listen to what Spurgeon continued on. He said, if sinners are zealous in their sins, should not saints be zealous for their God? If the things, oh, this is good. If the things of time can stir human passions, should not the realities of eternity have a greater and more tremendously moving force on us? 
that when God starts to move deep and we're going, we're not beginning to get excited on those things that won't last, but on those things that have eternity stamped on them. The best wood to ignite zeal is when you're reaching a billion souls. That's what God begins to do. We were just recently, Cindy and I, this week with World Challenge and Gary Wilkerson in Scotland, and we sat there, and, and I wasn't expecting to do this, but they asked me to do a youth service on Sunday night. 600 kids came together on Scotland, and here's what's amazing. Folks, this is what puts a log on my fire to keep zeal going. I, at the very end, I did to them what I do to you every Sunday. I said, you must be born again and went through the ABCs with these, with these young people, college and high school. And we saw, folks, I got tired of counting. So I got, I couldn't even see with the lights I got to 132 and got tired. They said there was probably about 200 of the 600 raised their hands to be born again in Scotland and for God to begin to come. What, what happens if the disciples don't come down from the mountain? The disciples needed to come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. Think about this. There's another Mount that they needed to come down from. Here's one more. How about the Sermon on the Mount? The greatest sermon ever preached by by humanity, in in, in all of humanity. The Son of God preaches Matthew 5, 6, and 7 from the Beatitudes and ending with, with a house built on sand or a house that's built on a firm foundation. What's incredible is this. When he's done, there has to be this this temptation to go one more chapter preach one more message. But Jesus couldn't because the Sermon on the Mount needed to become, here it is, the power on the ground. What do you mean, Pastor Tim? What we forget is what Matthew 8 has. Matthew 8, the sermon is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But in Matthew 8, there were four people that didn't need a sermon. They needed a miracle. Do you know who's in Matthew chapter 8? Here it is. A leper needed to be healed. A Roman centurion had a paralyzed staff member. Peter had a sick mother-in-law who was stuck in bed. And finally, there were two demoniacs that were in a graveyard causing havoc in a city. And if Jesus would have kept preaching, no leper would have been set free. No, no Roman centurion would have seen the power of Jesus begin to heal paralysis. Peter wouldn't have had his mother-in-law set free from a fever and two demoniacs would still be there cutting themselves and gnashing and screaming through the night. But because, because when God begins, when something is over, it means something better is coming. That when the sermon is over, God goes, watch the power on the ground. So let me close with this challenge of why Acts 3 comes after Acts 2. It's not profound, but it's important that the 120 needed to come down from the upper room. People needed them. God needed them. Zeal compelled them that the fire that burned in their soul literally was compelling them. Don't stay. Come down to the, to the end. To come down to the ground floor. So here's where we close. And, and, and we'll, we'll close Rather, listen, this is the last one. I'm just going to close whenever. So just play whenever music. Just play whenever music. So here it is. Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes down. Fire touches them. The church is started. The people were changed. But remember, when something is over, something better is coming. So here's how Acts 3 starts. Let me just read this to you. Make a couple comments, and then we're going to close. I'm going to commission you. Acts 3. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour. This is now, you have to remember, upper room is done. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. That's an important verse. I'll come back to that. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb, his legs have never held him up ever. Those legs have never experiencing jumping or running, jogging. Those legs didn't have enough stability not only to hold his weight up, he couldn't hold anybody up been carried there 
from his mother's womb, who they used to sit down every day at the temple gate, which is called beautiful, to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. And when he saw Peter and John go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed their gaze upon him and he said, look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give it to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, hallelujah, walk, hallelujah. And it says, seizing him by the right hand, raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. Ooh, this gets good. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk entered the temple. I love that he goes into the temple. The, the religion couldn't get him healed. But the power of God, religion can't heal you. God's power can heal you. And he entered the temple. Here it is. Walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the gate beautiful to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to this man. Oh, hallelujah. Listen to this. Folks, th this is what's important. I, I, I've got to give you this verse. Here it is. Acts 3.1. Peter and John were going up to the temple. This is the first verse. At the ninth hour. It's the hour of prayer. After the most powerful move of God of the church, the church leaves the building, leaves the upper room, and goes into society. What, what happens? Why, why, why is the ninth hour important? The ninth hour is actually 3 p.m. in the afternoon. God was not just calling them back to 3 p.m., but it's really God calling us to go back to 3 p.m. Christians. What do you mean? The ninth hour was the normal hour of prayer for the Jewish culture. Let me tell you what God was doing. God was saying, I moved, I equipped, I touched you, I gave you what you need. Now I want you to go back to your normal schedule and take what you have. And I want you to minister to other lives. So instead of them yelling at people to come to the upper room the upper room needed to go to the people what is a 3 p.m christian this is this is important it is a christian that has been touched by the holy spirit in a special meeting but now takes that new fire and zeal and brings it to their everyday environment here it comes they are new people in the same old place different person, same setting. A 3 p.m. Christian comes to the same place, but with a different heart and a different perspective. Get this in mind now. Keep this. Get this. God doesn't change places. He changes people and sends them to those places to be changed. There comes a time that you have to leave practice and get into the game. And in a sense, here it is, folks. Acts 3 will determine if Acts 2 is re actually real. If it really is an experience you had from God. Because real, the real life determines if the experience was real from God. Because if it's from God, it can go anywhere you go. Here it comes. Get this, get this, get this. You, you want to hear this. G. Campbell Morgan said it like this. If you cannot be a Christian where you are, you not, cannot be a Christian anywhere. It is not place, but grace. That's what it is. It's not place, but it's grace. So don't ever think, I can't be a Christian in Wall Street. I can't be a Christian at the UN. I can't be a Christian on Broadway. I can't be a Christian and work for the New York Yankees. I can't be a Christian and work for the Mets. I can't be a Christian in Dwayne Reed. You don't know about Dwayne Reed. 
Okay, let me just say, you can be a Christian anywhere. You can be a Christian in the hospital, NYU, Fordham. You can be a Christian on Long Island. You can be a Christian in the Bronx, Staten Island. You can be a Christian in Queen. You can be a Christian in the UK, France, Australia. You can be a Christian in Russia and the Ukraine. You can be, a, it's not place, it's grace. Now, here's where we almost finish. Why is this miracle significant? Why after the upper room? You got to get this now, folks. Why is it? Because this is the whole message. Why is it that the first miracle after the moving of the Holy Spirit happened to a lame man? Why is that the first miracle? I'm telling you. This became so real to me in Acts chapter in Acts chapter 3. Here's the reason. The lame man couldn't walk up the stairs to the upper room. The church needed to come down the stairs in order for the miracle to take place. Because while the church is shouting and fire coming down, that lame man doesn't get set free unless you realize something good is over so something better can happen that's what was happening god was beginning to say now it's time to come down those stairs and here it is here it is get this down quick three things happen You're just i'm just gonna just give them to you fast three things describe what a 3 p.m zealous christian is number one every day of the week replaces one day of the week you don't just get happy on sundays you can have zeal every day it, it, it's just not something you're going like I, I can shout on something you can shout you can you can sing you can worship listen I love Ricardo I love this band I love Mark I love everybody but we can't I can't bring them with me when I'm walking these streets he, he's not wheeling a keyboard down going and Ricardo's not going one more time he's not doing any of that you don't have any of that they're not they're not there but here's the good thing I don't need them I can lift my hands in my off-tune voice and worship God for who he is and say, why? There's a fire in my soul that says, God, I can worship anywhere. Here's what's amazing. You ready for this? I always thought that the most expensive place on the planet to advertise was Times Square to put up an ad in Times Square. It's not. The most expensive place in the, in the planet to advertise is moving so fast, it has to be so precise, and there's one key artist that does it. You ready for this? They said each time he does your advertise, your product, it's between 50 to 20 million. If you want to put it on the back end of this thing, it's even a half a million dollars, a little, a little thing. It's NASCAR. NASCAR. The thing is moving 200 miles an hour, and it costs 15 million to put your product on the hood of a NASCAR car. <laughs> Mike Bass is the guy that does it. And what's amazing, if you go there, you can't even see it. You can only see it on TV. If they slow it down, you're going, oh, look at that, it's on the... And the back panel is a half a million dollars for him to paint your product on. If we said, hey, let's take TSC and put it on the back, I'm going, I can figure out a lot better ways to use money for the kingdom than put it on a NASCAR. No offense to you NASCAR drivers or watchers or... or but but we'll teach you how to be a Simon the Zealot. But here, here it comes. Okay, watch this. That's what's, what's amazing is this thing is whipping by. And there are just moments that I think we're going so fast that we just don't slow down for people anymore. That we just, we, we, we go so fast right by them. And I don't even know if Peter and John realized because the man that they were going to talk to, it would have been so easy to go, we're, we're going to church, we can't even stop. And I just almost think that God was going, stop and pause. Because you know what it's like, folks. Listen, 
you know, it's like the man is out there asking for money. And listen, let me, let me talk to you New Yorkers right now. Okay, this, this, because it's always easy just to go, no, 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 just keep walking. If you look at them, they're going to say something to you. Just keep walking, just keep walking. And you just go like that. And don't pretend you don't know what I'm talking about because you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know where they are in your neighborhood and it's so easy to walk by. And God may be going, just stop and pause. Because, and here it comes. I'm gonna, I, I want you to understand this because this is the thing I want you to realize. I want to help you on the second part because if you can pause and stop, then you will start to see the ordinary will start to look like a candidate for the extraordinary. Because this guy was there every day. They saw this man every day, but God gave them new eyes. And I want to give you a phrase that is going to be, it's not profound, but man, it has been the most helpful phrase for taking gospel outside this church. And it's this, here it comes. This is the phrase I want to teach it to you. Can I pray for you? People will let you pray for them. They don't even have to be a believer. Can I just pray for you right now? Can I just pray for you? They'll tell me they're saying, can I just, but the problem is we're whipping by, we're the advertisement for Jesus. And that's why it's so important. Always remember this. There is a difference between knowing the good news and being the good news. And to be the good news, you have to pause. Sometimes you have to downshift. And instead of just whipping by them to catch the train, you just got to sometimes you have to pause and go, can I just pray for you? Can I pray for you today? And who knew that on that day, that man would leap? Who knew that on that day, that man would start jumping in the house of God again? Who knew? And as you stand with me, stand up. This is the other part that I realized. Here it comes. A testimony can have more power than even a sermon. I know some preachers are going to be upset with me, but I have to tell you this. A testimony can have more power than even... This man jumping and leaping was the result of 2,000 people getting saved in Acts 4.4. And here's what's, this is the part I love. Listen to these words again. Acts 3.8. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. Entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And the people saw him. Look at this. And the people saw him walking and pray, uh, took note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement. What had happened to this man? That sometimes the greatest proof that God is alive, we would say in theology, the greatest apologetic or the greatest proof that God is alive is a changed life. It's a changed life. And folks, let me just help you so we can get rid of all criticalness in this. When you see somebody jumping and spinning, and you don't know their story. You don't know what God rescued them from. And so before, before you label them, before you look at these amazing singers up here and watch them spinning and jumping, you're going like, oh, that's just for show. You don't know what God delivered them from. You don't know where they were at. You don't know where they used to be lame and God all of a sudden speaks life over them. And when you see them jumping, leaping and praising God, maybe, maybe, here's, here's what needs to happen. That's why when you're sitting here, when you see someone jumping and leaping, maybe instead of going, look at them, maybe you need to go, maybe you need to say this, man, God, you're good. I don't know what they were delivered from. And, and maybe, maybe the higher they jump, the more junk that God has delivered them from. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? And the louder, sometimes the, 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 the loudest shouts because they've been, they've been set free from so much in their life. So here's the part, yeah, back there, there's a lot of bondage that has been set free in that back space over there. It's that spot, this section right over there. That's the section. That's the, you have no idea. You have no idea what God has done. So when you see somebody start to get excited, I'm telling you, a testimony is sometimes the greatest proof God is good. God is alive and God still sets free. That's right. 
I love the picture when it says, when, it's, when it simply looks at them and they said they were standing, they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to this man. And it, it, it's so amazing because the Bible tells us that he was standing next to Peter. So if, if this, if Ricardo is Peter and I'm the layman and the Bible talks about it, it gives us this nuance that he was holding on to them. But I could see as Peter is preaching, he's saying, you've crucified Christ. And this man has been raised up. I could see this man just the whole time going. <laughs> like, I could, I could see Peter like, ah, and this thing going. <laughs> and, just, so, and, and so they're listening to a message and a testimony at the same time. So while they're hearing truth, they're seeing miracle. While they're hearing a sermon, they're seeing a changed life. While they're hearing that man preach, they're going, it has to be true. Look at what has happened in this person's life. Okay, that's why I want to invite you on Tuesday night, this, this is the whole month of, of uh, October, you're going to hear testimonies. So on Tuesday nights, We'll close the service, but we're going to have worship testimony. Worship test. You're going to hear people's stories. You're going to hear about lame men and lame women. Why they're up here testifying. God delivered me. God's three testimonies every Tuesday. So come this Tuesday. If you have friends that you're going, I want to see them get saved. Let them hear a testimony. Let them hear. And on Tuesday nights, there's going to be, for the month of October, three, two, for, there's going to be three testimonies each of those nights. Because when God touches you folks it spreads like fire you can't stay stuck on Sunday here it is God didn't change you for church God changed you for everyday life that's what he didn't set you free to so you can be sophisticated on Sunday he set you free put a fire inside of you I was reminded by something an old spiritual father said in my life, he said these words. He said, Christianity today is so subnormal that if anyone was to act like a normal Christian, they're going to be considered abnormal. Welcome to an abnormal church. I'm just going to tell you that right now. I'm, tell I'm telling you folks. You can do whatever you want. I'm signing up for abnormal because I just want to be a normal New Testament crowd. I want to be what God... It, listen, if you're looking for religion, hang out with us a little bit. Because if you're hang, looking for religion, you're not going to find it, but we're hoping the fire becomes contagious and you go, wait a second. The temple didn't set that man free. Jesus set that free. Folks, I can tell you this. Let me just tell you, before you start thinking like he doesn't like temples and mosques, let me just say, Times Square Church can't set you free either. Only Jesus can set you free. There's not a thing. There's not one person, starting with me, that can set you. You can't be set free by us, but Jesus can set you free. The fire in me is Jesus. The passion in me is Jesus. The fire that's in my soul is from God himself. And I'm telling you, I will shout, I will preach, I will pray, I will worship, I will thank God for what I'm going to leap and shout and praise God today. Hallelujah. When something is over, something better is about to happen. Now I've got to commission you. It's the moment of a service that we usually invite people to come forward to be prayed for. Not now. I got to commission you. I want you to take the hand of the person next to you. I'm going to commission you because this series is over. I'm leaving. Yeah, glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm going to leave this place today. I'm going to get something to eat and I'm taking a nap. Reach across those aisles because I don't want anybody to sneak out. I want you to, we're going to block them in today. How many remember that song? How many remember that old kids game? Red Rover, Red Rover. So, and you have to hold hand, they have to break through. Hold that hand tight in the aisles because I don't want anybody. And if they say they have to go to the bathroom, just say, hold it. I shouldn't have said that. Don't put that on the, get that off. I shouldn't have said that. That's what happens when you're at the end of a series. <laughs> okay, here's what, here's what we're going to do. You're holding right now on either side of you 
you're holding the hands of those soldiers that are about to go out. You're holding the hands of the people that you're going to pray. God, you're going to commission them. Put a zeal inside of them. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you in a second. Here it comes. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to become a little fanatical. I'm going to ask you to pray for the person on your right and on your left out loud. I don't know their name. You don't have to know their name. All you, all you got to do is you're just going to go, you're going to pray, God, I'm praying for my brother, for my sister. I pray, put a fire in their soul today. Go ahead. Start praying for them right now. Just say, God, when they leave this place, come on church, let's pray. Come on, pray fervently for them. Fervently. Let fire come. Hallelujah. Pray that when they leave this building, a zeal, a zeal, a zeal. Pray that God use them in their school, neighborhood. Pray fire upon them, a new fire. Lame to walk, dead to rise, friends to be saved. Come on, church, pray for them. Hallelujah. Come on, five more seconds, just pray for them. Pray that fire of God. Now let go and lift your hands and just worship him right now. Come on, zealous, let's worship him. Let's worship him. Let's worship him. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We worship you, oh God. I commission this army, I commission these believers to be zealous in good works. I commission them with zeal, a fire inside of them. I commission them to go back to their school, to their hospitals. I commission them to go back to their apartments, their states, and their countries. I commission them, oh God, to walk into places that the lame would walk, that the lost would be found. I pray prodigals would come home. I pray for healing. I'm praying for miracles. I'm praying that you're going to use them to speak truth and bring truth. I commission them in Jesus' name. I pray a new boldness. I pray a new fire. I pray, oh God, and a new confidence and courage rises up inside of them that the people that used to intimidate them would say, no longer, no longer. You will not intimidate me. I walk with God now. I have God on my side right now. A new confidence, a new anointing, new anointing upon them right now. Oh, hallelujah. 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 New anointing. So when you walk out of this place today and you start seeing people dance on Broadway, just go, they must be from Times Square Church. That's a fire inside, but I can't leave. Listen, I'm going to tell you, there's a fire that burns in my soul that before we sing, there's a fire that burns in my soul for a billion souls. There's a fire in my soul. I would never let you leave this place without giving you a chance to be born again. Ever. It's my heart, my desire. I just, and you know what? People look at me, they'll laugh. They, sometimes I have, I have leaders will laugh and they'll look at me. A billion saw you out of your mind. I'm going, listen, it doesn't matter what anybody, I know what God is speaking. I know what God is saying. If you're here today and you're wondering, those people are crazy, but they got something I don't have. It's Jesus. This building is not magic. This building doesn't do it. It's because we have Christ inside of us. The grace of God has come. And you today, balcony, main floor, you that are watching, listen to me. Those that are watching from Kenya and Australia, those that are watching from France and Norway, Those that are watching from Chile and Venezuela and Canada, listen to me today. If you're here in this place and you're going, I don't have that passion, I don't have that. 
I'm not inviting you to get passion. I'm not inviting you to get zeal. I'm inviting you to a relationship with Christ. Because when he comes in, I'm telling you, when he comes in, you're going, I don't know what's happening, but my hands are going up. I don't know what's happening, but I'm getting, I'm feeling joy. I'm feeling joy. I don't know what's happening, but I feel something happening inside of my soul. That's God moving inside of me. But that doesn't happen from church. It doesn't happen from religion. There's not a mosque or a temple. There's not a cathedral or a church that can do that. There's not a preacher or a priest. There's not a rabbi. There's, can't do it. Only Jesus can. And if you're sitting here today and go, Pastor Tim, I want Christ in my life. I want my life changed today. I want a fire. I want Christ in me. Let me just tell you something. When you start to realize my sins are forgiven, I'm on my way to heaven, I'm telling you a joy starts to hit you. A joy starts to hit you. If you don't believe it, then why haven't you left? You've been sitting here for over two hours. What is it? What is it? What, why, why are your feet stuck? That you're going, I want to leave so bad, but something is keeping me here. I'm going to tell you, because it's time to get born again today, right now, right now. That's Jesus' work. That can happen. Your life can be changed right now. Jesus gave you an invitation to be forgiven and to spend eternity with him. But you have to RSVP, and I want to give you the chance to RSVP. If you're here today, online, in person, I want to pray a prayer that invites Christ to come in and change you. And you're here to say, I want to RSVP. Here's how you're going to RSVP. It's just simply doing this. With every head looking around, every eye open, if you're going, Pastor Tim, when you pray that prayer to ask Christ to come into our lives, I'm RSVPing today. If that's you, hold up your hand. Say, I'm RSVPing right now. Hold it up high. Look, a whole second. Yes, 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 yes. All the way back there. Yes, all of you. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. Yes, got you in the balcony. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on, let's all pray. All of us, let's pray this together. Say this out loud with me, everybody. Dear Lord Jesus. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on now. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. The Bible is my guide. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen.